Hi, and welcome to the NASCO Safety Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Piven, and today we're going to talk about photoionization detectors. I have with me the Associate Professor, Dr. Mark Knight from Waterloo University. Welcome, Mark. And we're going to kick it off before we get into the details on photoionization detectors. I'd like to talk a little bit about the study that you partnered with a number of years ago on laterals because we used PIDs in that study. Yes, we did. Uh, so we'll come back to them, but let's, let's kick this off and talk a little bit about uh, styrene and laterals and what that study looked like. But before we go there, I want you to tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell, tell the audience who you are and how long you've been in the industry. Well, thank you, Dennis, for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure to be able to do this. Um, I started at the University of Waterloo 27 and a half years ago, believe it or not. Wow. And I've been involved in the trenchless industry um, pretty well since I started at the University of Waterloo. So um, my main research area has been trenchless technologies. Initially I s tried to stay away from um, pipe rehab, but I kind of got involved in it, started doing a lot of CIPP liner testing. Okay. And, um, and then got into uh, pipeline rehab using um, condition assessment and, um, and then into uh, pressure pipe rehab. Wow. That's, that's it's a lot. You covered a lot of ground, Mark. And you've written a lot of papers, a lot of white papers yeah, in your tenure at Waterloo. Yeah, white papers and been involved in development standards, AWWA standards, um, heavily involved in NASCO and the Pressure Pipe Committee I co-chair, and um, as well as ISO standards. Awesome. All good stuff. So let's kind of jump into this horizontal study that we did on laterals, right? Um, give them the background of what we were trying to do with that study. Yeah, the main question really was um, what happens to migration of styrene if, if it does occur um, out of the main line after lining is done up through the laterals and how effective are P-traps in, in stopping the migration of styrene out. So we um, developed a uh, typical application. Um, we did the study in um, St. Louis out in right, Chesterfield, yeah, right? In Chesterfield, yeah, at, Missouri. At, yeah. at the in situ form, just outside in situ form headquarters and um, in a field. So what we did was we put in the eight inch clay pipe. Um, we put in laterals um, on both sides. Uh, one were the dry side where the P-trap was not filled with water and the other side we had them filled with um, um, water. And we lined the pipe and then we used a variety of different instrumentation to uh, measure uh, styrene movements and migration um, through the different types of laterals. We used uh, PIDs, we used uh, the 3M organic vapor monitors. Vapor monitors, and right. then um, what was the other the one? Waterloo sampler. The, the Waterloo sampler, the <laughs> Waterloo might, membrane sampler. Yeah, you I'll might have to explain that for our audience for a second. What, what was exactly the Waterloo membrane sampler? Yeah, it was a device that was developed um, by a, uh, one of the chemistry professors and patented. It's basically a glass tube with um, charcoal in, on the inside with a unique membrane and the membrane is what really is unique. Um, it uh, allows materials to go, um, chemicals to go in uh, the sampler um, and absorb to the, uh, to the carbon and, um, and it's not impacted by water, va water vapors. So uh, what you can do afterwards is um, it just basically leave it open for a period of time. It will measure the amount of concentration. Then you can do a typical ga gas chromatograph scan um, and find out what uh, total amount of styrene or whatever chemicals, VOCs, um, came into that tube open during the time. So it really gives you your exposure risk over that right. time period. It's, it's a diffusion type monitor it is. in itself. Yeah, it's the exactly. membrane is the secret sauce there exactly. that allows the chemicals to come in but then they can't stay there, they can't get out, they stay trapped in the carbon. Yeah, and the and main application that you used it for was really gasoline um, vapor monitor and vapor monitoring and the stuff, and then we applied it for the first time in this job, and it actually worked extremely well. Okay, so that was an eight inch main. Correct, right? clay we, pipe. That we lined, so we buried clay pipe, and then we lined it with CIPP. Correct. And I think styrene concentrations are around 30% in that resin that we yeah, used that day. That's right. right that's so, right. So we had a rough idea of what our concentrations on styrene were just from the base resin. Yeah. And again, just to reiterate, we were measuring the styrene migration up the laterals toward the P-traps. Yep. And the P-traps on one side were dry and the P-traps on the other side were filled with water. Correct. So we, we've outlined the test protocols now. Tell them the results. Tell them the results. 
Well, we did find that there was styrene released during the cure, um, and it basically peaked, and then they started to drop during um, the cool-down process. So there's a finite amount of styrene. It's not a continuous source of styrene released during the in install, so we measured, we measured that part. Okay. Um, and we measured some emissions on the other one. Um, the, the cool thing was that um, any P-trap that had water in it, nothing came out, no, no styrene came out of the P-traps, regardless of how we tried to measure it. So P-traps are 100% effective in stopping styrene migration um, out of the laterals. The laterals that had no water in them and they were dry, um, we had measured styrene concentrations that came out. We also measured the styrene concentrations the next day, and we basically found out that it wasn't, didn't take very long for them all to basically go to uh, zero, um, even in the laterals. I mean, the laterals that were vented to the air moved or reduced very quickly, but even the ones that had um, styrene in the laterals, there was right. styrene in the laterals, they also right. decreased relatively fast, which is typical because styrene has a half-life and it's going to disappear. Right. So let's recap for our audience, right? So the functional P-trap did a great job. Yep. And not only is it preventing styrene from moving into a building or a home, it's preventing other gases like oh, H2S, exactly. methane, right? Yeah. So it's a great indicator of you might have a plumbing problem if you're smelling these things that you need to address. That's well. a very oh, good point. Right? Yeah. I mean, nice, the nice thing. The good thing about styrene is we can smell it at extremely small concentrations. And so it's an indicator that if you have your basement or your house where they're doing a CIPP lining job and you start to smell some styrene, the other thing that we ended up doing was some numerical modeling to show that uh, if you open up your house and you open up your windows and you vent, if you do smell something, you're going to lower those concentrations very quickly okay. and to make them uh, extremely small if you've got a defective uh, P-trap or defective plumbing. Okay. But the other good news is that... Um, you now know that you have a plumbing problem in your house and there's sewer gases and those sewer gases will migrate through those laterals and come into your house and you will be exposed to those over a long period of time in your house. So you really need to get your plumbing fixed and that's why plumbing code requires P-traps in, in your house is to reduce that exposure that, that risk. Is, right, right. So we're trying to eliminate the possibility of getting methane in your house, hydrogen sulfide or any other gas that might be in that sewer. Exactly. Right? At any time. So I think the study was important not only for styrene, but for the reasons we just pointed out. Yeah, right? and you never know what's going to happen into a sewer, and sometimes sewers are cross-connected to storm drains, and someone up the streets <laughs> decide that they want to get some get rid of some gasoline, and they'll pour it down that. Well, those VOCs will be coming down, and you would have that same potential if you've got faulty plumbing to be exposed to some gas vapors yes. that came from, 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 from your neighbor. Okay, good. All right, so let's move over now and talk about photoionization detection. Yeah. I think it's important. We learned a lot when we, we did a study on PIDs. Why don't you hit some of the highlights of some of the things we learned there? Well, the first thing people should do when they're using an instrument is understand how the instrument works and read the manual for the instrument. Because if you read the manual, you learn, you learn a lot. First of all, photoionization detectors do not measure styrene concentrations. Um, what they do is they measure volatile organic carbons, VOCs, which is a large group of chemicals that are lighter than air and, that, and they can be in sewers. Um, it's the same instrument that the fire um, fighters will come if you've got a methane or if you've got CO2, um, they'll come in and they'll measure some concentrations on that. So what you do is, and according to the manual, have to calibrate the, in the instrument um, to measure VOCs. Okay. And, and use isobrutaline as your, as your gas uh, to calibrate. So if you're reading 100, on that, 100 ppm on that, it's 100 ppm right. isobrutaline. That's VOC. That's what it's calibrated to. Um, if you have styrene and you're working in a plant, you can calibrate that instrument. And typical the calibration is 0.4. Um, for the PID. So in that case, if you're reading 100 ppm isobrutaline and the calibration factor is 0.4, it's 40 ppm styrene. So you can measure indirectly the concentration of styrene if you know what the mixture of gases and the stuff are. 
If you have a combination of mixture of gases, which can often happen, especially in the CIPP cure, it's not, it's only 30% styrene resin. There's some other stuff that happens until that cross-linking happens and you go from a liquid to a solid. Right. Um, then, you know what, you could be reading 100 ppm on your PID of isobrutaline, but it actually could be much less than 40. Okay. It could be down to 15 or 10, and you really won't know unless you know what that gas concentration is. So it's very careful, you have to be very careful, and I've seen studies that have been published where they write the PID number and they equate that to styrene concentration, and they're way overestimating the amount of styrene that's, that's there. So, you know, that's a great point. So let, let's kind of drill into that a little bit for two reasons. One, you mentioned fire departments who come in or come out, right? And, yeah. and I love my firefighters. They do great work, but I don't think they fully understand the, how to use a PID. And in a lot of cases, their PIDs are uh, four gas sensors with a PID sensor. Right. Not separate unit, right? So the calibration issue becomes a challenge for the fire departments, and they're certainly not going to calibrate it to styrene. Correct. So a typical firefighter, uh, fire department who comes in with a four gas with a PID in it is not going to be able to specifically detect styrene. Is that correct? Correct. I'm understanding that right? So what they're reading on their PID could be a combination of other things. Uh, for example, I, I know in a case that I had uh, where they went into a house for a complaint that they had an odor, uh, I asked them if they walked through the garage and they said they did. I asked them if there was a lawnmower in there or gas cans, and they said yes. And so that could be picked up on a PID, right? Oh, you, you yeah. definitely pick up those VOCs and those other, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so exactly. it's got nothing to do with styrene. So that you, you come back. So it's really important before you do a study or you use is to know what the background levels were at that location with a PID before this, because there may be VOCs in that sewer and that Pro, you know that we're know. The, that you don't even know, so you have to get those background levels. And where PID is very useful, if you know what the background level is, and you do a, a lining job, and there's a difference, then you can attribute that difference and that increase to 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 the difference in some styrene release being released. It's a, it's a VOC. So yeah, the other key thing about a VOC, which is very different than the water loop membrane sampler. Is a PID is an is a reading instantaneous in a point of time. Yeah, great right? point, right? right? Right. So you yep. you know you you're you're measuring a graph. Risk exposure is the concentration times time. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. And I always use when I when I talk about this, I always say how how many people in here put gas in your car, and everybody will raise their hand. I said how many people here have been smell gasoline when they put it in their car and everybody will raise their hand. Well, I said, you've been, you've been exposed to a known carcinogen. So that is an instantaneous time where you smell gasoline and it, there's, you know, but you're allowed to do it because your exposure time is so small. And the same thing with styrene and CIPP. And the PID. How and, and, the P and the PID. Number. So we, what we do is we, we need to measure that area underneath that graph over a period of time. Right. And, and that gives you your exposure risk and, 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 your, and your health risk. And, and the nice thing about uh, styrene is there's a finite number of styrene. And if the, if the people do the cure properly, most of that 30% of styrene gets locked into the chemical structure. It's no longer free to move. And there's a very little residual styrene that's left and it dissipates, so it's a finite mass. So again, on the PID, it'll spike. It'll spike. Because it's gonna give you that instantaneous reading yeah. and then it will come back down. Then it comes back down very quickly. Very quickly, right? So and, you have to understand how the instrument works is what you're pointing out. I, and, I absolutely and, agree and, with you. It exactly, and, and, and that spike has nothing to do with your exposure risk because it says, hey, 20 ppm, but that's 20 ppm over eight hours a day not 20 ppm for five seconds. Right, right. One other thing I want to talk to you about on PIDs that I've seen in some other white papers, and, and you and I experienced this, is moisture. Yeah. And how moisture can affect, yeah. in a negative way, PIDs. Can you help our it, audience understand that? Yeah, I mean, it, it basically blocks or can, 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 can contribute to an error in, in that, not functionally reading, but the actual concentrations of the VOCs are. And if, if you've got an air and moisture and you put this PID in a, in, a, in a steam plume or something that's got a lot of moisture, well, then you're going to get 
erroneous errors. Okay, because so, yeah. that moisture actually attacks the sensor yeah, it does. in the PID, right? Yeah. And I think what you and I noticed on a few occasions was that's before that sensor would fail, it gave very high readings, did yeah. it not? Yeah, it okay. would, yeah. yeah. So I think sometimes that data gets confused because they see a high reading yeah. and they go, oh, that must be styrene, and then all of a sudden their instrument fails and you know, is that number a legitimate number? Most likely not because the sensors. Yeah, and if you look at some of the papers that were published earlier where they talked about styrene and they only used the PID, they didn't really understand the PIDs. And now you start to look at some of their information, the stuff that actually contradict what they used to say. Because right. now they're starting to realize what they were actually measuring instead of what they thought they were measuring. Right. So there was a lot of misinformation out there. So it's part of the learning process. Part of it. But as, as I said, anytime you're measuring using a device, you should understand how to calibrate the device, how to make sure you do your background checks, mm -hmm. to make sure you know what your background levels are, and to make sure that you understand what you're measuring. Right. So we're getting close to wrapping up. We want to kind of summarize for our audience again yeah. on PIDs, right? And I think you just kind of did it. But let's, for those who are new, they come out, they're just going to use their PID for the first time. They just bought it. They, they think this is a good tool. It is a good tool. Great tool. If you understand how to use it, what would be three things you would advise them on how to how Make to sure it's this? calibrated and using a known gas. Right. Make sure you know what you're measuring. You're measuring VOCs of isobrutylene or whatever you used for calibration. Know your calibration factor for the chemicals that you're using. If it's styrene and pure styrene, it's 0.4. So you get a reading 100, multiply it by 0.4, you're at 40. Okay. Right? If you've got multiple gases, it's probably going to be even less um, on, on those ones. And then measure, know that you're only measuring concentration in a period of time. So, yeah. Okay. And then most importantly, make sure you do your background checks. Get your background levels because there's all kinds of other VOCs that you could have and then use it as a reference difference. Awesome. Well, Dr. Knight, thank you so much for going through this, this study with us and how to better use PIDs. I'm sure there's a lot of folks who watch this that are going to learn a lot today on how to use that instrument to the best. My right? pleasure. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed our topic for today. Thanks for joining the NASCO Safety Podcast. For more information on safety topics, please go to nasco.org, click on safety, and choose your safety topic.